Hey, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I was looking back through some old newspapers this morning to get a sense of how the day was marked in the Union Army of the Potomac. Uh, and of course, there's no better man to do it than the individual pictured here, General Thomas Francis Marr, the leader, the commander, the charismatic head of the Irish Brigade. New York newspapers were all over the coverage. In March of 1863, I found a great report uh, about the day's festivities in Virginia. And I want to read to you a few excerpts. I think you'll really enjoy it. So let's begin with this, this quote. The same spirit that presided at Benbrook, Limerick, and Fontenoy animated and inspirited the festivities of the day for the Irish character in old Erin or America, in war as in peace, is ever the same, his spirit unbroken and his muscles never tired. <laughs> what a great way to start this report. Uh, the, the, the reporter who covered this goes on to talk about what the sort of set the stage for what's going on. So here we go. The preparations for the proper celebration were appropriate and ample. A, a sizable and spacious chapel had been erected from canvas and uniquely ornamented with evergreen wreaths, festoons, and bouquets. A new and elegant investment had been purchased by the men to presented by their chaplain, the Reverend Mr. Corby. The vine and foliage and fruit, the lamb and the cross that characterize the vestment are elaborate, rich, and elegant. So the story goes on. They talk about the festivities beginning at 8 o'clock in the morning with the celebration of a grand mass. You have General Marr and the staff, all of the regiments of the brigade, talking about thousands of people, uh, and uh of all the invited guests, the women, all the other folks who are invited. So things are starting to gather. Things are starting to get rolling. About 1030 in the morning, this huge race course has been erected by the men. And uh, of course, Mar is there leading the way. So I want to give you a little description of that race course that they set up. Here we go. Uh, the immense concourse for General Marr had invited many guests, had collected on the field, prepared for the races. These are the horse races that are gonna be consuming the bulk of the day. The course was a fraction over a mile in length in an open level field. It was broken by four hurdles, each four feet high and four ditches, each eight feet wide and four feet deep. On the north side of the course were erected three platforms. That in the middle, about 20 feet high, was for the accommodation of the umpire and his associates, celebrities who might be present, and for members of the press. The stage on the left, six feet high, was exclusively for the ladies, and a similar one on the right for the use of bands and music, two being present, the 127th Pennsylvania and the 12th New Jersey. Now, the next part of the story pays tribute to our master of ceremonies, General Marr, Listen to this description. It's wonderful. Most prominent of all men was General Marr, who without doubt was master of ceremonies. A white staple hat smashed in at one side, a green cravat with large bow and white flowing ends, and a rosette of blue ribbon on a brown coat, white gloves, white silk velvet half breeches, and high yellow top boots completed his uniform. He rode a very sprightly bay horse and carried in his hand a long-lashed whip. His form was seen everywhere in incredibly short periods of time, and above all noise and confusion rang the voice of the gallant Irish commander. Oh, what a vision! <laughs> that's, I have to tell you, that's my favorite part of the whole story. A big chunk of the report goes on to detail the horse races that occurred during the day. Of course, there's cheering, the thunderous applause, followed by the galloping horses around the track, pieces of mud being flown off the hooves of the horses. The bands are playing. Everyone is screaming. 
we are in the height of the events. What a wonderful moment. Afterwards, the winners, the losers, it doesn't matter. Everybody has had a great time. Then the partying begins. A glass of wine was passed to General Hooker. You've got the commander of the Army of the Potomac fighting. Joe Hooker is there. The report says General Hooker was called upon to drink a toast. Raising his glass, Hooker exclaims, the Irish Brigade, God bless them. Then he proposes and leads three cheers for the Irish Brigade. And again, unbounded cheers sounded over the field for the commander-in-chief. Now, the report continues, at this stage of the proceedings, General Marr received a dispatch from the Knights of St. Patrick in New York, who sent their greetings to the Irish Brigade, representing the spirit of Irishmen on the battlefields of America. Now, wow, as if that weren't enough, we have the final bit of the report, and you may be surprised how it ends. It ends rather abruptly after all the ceremony. Here's what happens. Quote, the races having ended, General Marr invited his guests to accompany him to brigade headquarters, where sandwiches and punch had been provided for thousands. Here, glasses and speeches and toasts and music, as in the days of old Lang Syne, went freely round and all were merry and gay. Just after the foot race had come off, it was reported that heavy firing had been heard on the right, believed to be at the United States Ford. General Marr immediately announced the festivities were at an end and at once ordered the brigade to fall in under arms. The men dropped their sports and rushed to arms with as much good cheer and alacrity as during the day they had joined in the festivities. What a way to end St. Patrick's Day in the Army of the Potomac and the Irish Brigade on March 17, 1863, with a call to arms by the sturdy Irishmen. Doesn't get much better than that. So there you have it. A moment, March 17, 1863, American Civil War, celebrating Ireland's St. Patrick. Take care. We'll see you the next time on Life on the Civil War Research Trail.